Good morning, everybody. My name is Deb Savaris and I'm the CEO for the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare. Thank you for joining us here on this uh, beautiful day. I'm in Melbourne. It's sunny, which is gorgeous. Um, today's webinar um, will discuss changes in working, innovation and impacts on clients that have been developed and implemented during COVID-19. But without moving forward, I must acknowledge this beautiful land that we're on here today. I'm on Wurundjeri land here, uh, the Kulin Nation land um, in Melbourne. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge elders past and present, uh, emerging Aboriginal leadership and elders from other cultures. Today's webinar is part of what we call the Tri Peaks Project. Many of you will know about this. Um, it's become very high profile, particularly during COVID. It's a collaboration between the Centre for Excellence in Child and Family Welfare, the Victorian Healthcare Association and the Victorian Alcohol and Drug Association to support integrated practice and good governance across our three sectors. This is funded by the state government and is a real innovation and has become incredibly important as a vehicle during COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we will hear from three amazing CEOs from across the child and family, alcohol and other drug and community health sectors. Bronwyn Pike, CEO of Uniting Vic Taz. Nicole Bartholomew, and I knew I would find your last name difficult, Nicole, but lovely to have you with us. Um, the CEO of CoHealth, and Dr. Stephen Grunat, uh, the CEO of Odyssey House Victoria. Each CEO will present for 10 minutes, followed by a Q&A and discussion session. And I really hope we do have time for Q&A, uh, but we have a fast and furious hour ahead of us, so we will try our best. This is a Zoom webinar, so please use the chat and Q&A functions for your questions and comments. And we know now that many of you are very good at using this technology. So please use it to the full extent possibly, possibly that you can. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Bronwyn Pike. She's the CEO of Uniting Vic Taz. Bronwyn has extensive experience across the the public, private and community services sectors. Bronwyn was the Victorian State Member of Parliament for Melbourne from 1999 to 2012. Her 13 year parliamentary career included 11 years as a Minister for Housing, Aged Care, Community Services, Health, Education and Skills. Before entering Parliament in 1999, Bronwyn was the Director of Justice and Social Responsibility in the Synod of Victoria, which provided Ch child, youth, family and aged care services, as well as social justice advocacy. Bon Bronwyn has considerable governance experience at a national and state level, and she's chaired numerous boards, the boards of Western Health, the South Australian Urban Renewal Authority in Uniting Care Australia, and has been a board member of Australian Health Policy Collaboration, um, Leap In and Uniting New South Wales ACT, amongst many other um, notable things that she's done. Um, we're really looking forward to hearing what Bronwyn has to say this morning. So over to you, Bronwyn. Thanks very much, Deb. And um, great to be here with uh, also Nicole and Stefan today and um, to be with all of you. And thank you so much for joining um, yet another Zoom meeting. We're all um, becoming much more adept at uh, using this format and um, we're hopeful that, um, of course, things will be um, moving to the opportunity for a better mix between Zoom and face-to-face. -face. But they really, that's partly what we're talking about today is you know what we've been able to do as an organization um, to use the COVID crisis as an opportunity for innovation and reflection on our practice um, both at a whole of organization level and at a service and program level so I want to talk about the ways that uh, we've been working consultatively to support our staff to adjust to working differently and to give you a few examples of um, how services have adapted to meet uh, consumer needs. So on to the next slide is one way in which we've consulted with our staff was by partnering with workplace consultants DEXAS to survey staff in the first round um, of the restrictions. Um, everyone was invited to participate and um, 1,200 people, about a third of our staff, um, 
actually filled in um, the survey. And obviously one of the biggest adjustments uh, was working from home. Prior to the pandemic, 84% of staff had said they rarely or never worked from home. 70% now say that they actually uh, want to work from home one or more days a week when home restrictions are lifted. That was the first time round. Maybe if we did it now, there might be some slight nuances, but I think all of us are experiencing the highs and lows, but some, some real opportunities from working remotely. Um, and people I think are looking for more flexible work arrangements post COVID. Um, Whilst everyone, we'll move on to the next slide now. Whilst everyone um, said they were able to work productively, there was, of course, a variety of experience, just, just as we are, uh, you know, a variety of different human beings with life circumstances. And some of our staff really valued the opportunity to concentrate and balance work and home, but others have really struggled with social isolation and uh, really, really missed um, the human to human contact in the work environment. And of course, we know that, you know, people who are doing homeschooling and um, people who've got responsibilities for others, etc., have found this particularly challenging as well. We've actually tried to uh, respond in, in helpful ways, um, connecting people um, right across the organisation. I've been doing a lot of regular video messages. We've created lots of social networks. We've got book clubs. We've got obviously lots of eating stuff. You know, there's so many meals get put up on the, on the internet, don't they? Um, and uh, we've been using Microsoft Teams and the internet. And we've also been showing appreciation uh, for people's work. We've given people a staff appreciation day. That's an extra day of, of leave, um, gift vouchers, um, letters to frontline workers and to volunteers. So, you know, really trying to lift people's spirits and let them know that it's a tough environment and we really appreciate what they're doing. On the next slide, we're talking about how people are also learning things about themselves. And here you can see that adapting and being resilient, flexible and new strengths that people are discovering in themselves. Um, so in addition to trying to develop people's connection to their co-workers, we're also trying to get people to reflect on those strengths and to think about how those strengths are really useful um, as they you know, are engaged in their work. And um, we've also made a lot more personal development courses and tools available through our internet for people to utilise. As I've said, next slide now, um, uh, we're, we've also had a major change in the way we deliver services. Um, and while we have exemptions to continue operating, we also have a responsibility to ensure that the way we operate is safe for our staff and our community. So this one talks about emergency relief. And in Tasmania, our emergency relief teams were undertaking grocery deliveries before their lockdown. Um, but in Paran, and that's the picture here, we're partnering with Fair Share Rotary Launch Housing and Coles to deliver packs of groceries, personal care products, reheatable meals, um, and of course, these are things that are, were often pre, uh, prepared in our Hartley's Cafe, which is the, the drop-in centre there in Paran. Um, the packs are delivered on Fridays to support people over the weekend. And we're also, of course, doing a lot of takeout food as well. So home delivery of emergency relief is something that we're considering post COVID. I think, you know, I've been reflecting a lot on what we message people by making people come to us all the time. And, you know, I think we've learned in COVID that going to people, meeting them where they are is um, something that we need to build on. Um, we know that people, for example, having to line up for emergency relief, you know, can bring about shame and stigma and we want to do everything we can. And we've learned a lot about that, I think, in this environment. Um, next slide, uh, we want to talk about our 
changes um, to service delivery for our withdrawal services. So, you know, obviously um, our staff have, you know, had to have additional PPE, um, but, um, and uh, we made a decision very uh, early on that um, uh, we need to COVID test clients when they're first admitted to our residential facilities. And then of course, a few days before they are discharged. Um, we did have one positive case. Um, um, uh, so when you, uh, and, uh, but that turned out to, uh, that person was actually asymptomatic when they arrived. So, you know, that obviously brought its own challenges. To, at the start of the pandemic, we thought people would, people would go into panic mode and would put their withdrawal um, in the too hard basket. But actually, we've gone from a 30 person to a 70 person waiting list. Um, and uh, we've also had a significant drop in our no show rates. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, we, uh, we've been able to um, provide people with um, video tours of our residential facility and we've actually found that that's a really helpful way of um, getting people ready to uh, for the fact of coming into a withdrawal facility and that's actually um, the evidence is showing in fact that by preparing people better through an online environment we're actually retaining them much longer and we've um, it really um, increased our, our numbers since the start of COVID. We've done 140% of our targeted numbers of client assessments and, and outreach. And you know, for years people have telling counsellors particularly have been telling us that only face-to-face -face counselling is effective. But we have found during COVID that counsellors can work from home and um, that people are feeling safe. And in fact, our clients are engaging um, in their treatment um, a lot more effectively. Um, on the next slide, I want to talk about the 1800 uh, Wimmera line, the call for help line, um, which um, where the community has been supported through access to a variety of services. And that's, you know, a local response that's kind of wrapped around a lot of different what were individual service intake environments. Um, a new in initiative called Connecting You has also helped us with our isolated aged consumers. Um, and uh, we are um, working very hard with volunteers as well as our own staff. And we've been assisting people to use technology, older people who never used that kind of technology before, like all of us, I think are skilling up uh, in, in this environment. And in uh, our drug and alcohol services, um, providing counselling over the phone has, as I said, um, significantly increased um, our participation in face-to-face -face services. Um, as we know, and, and I'm sure we'll hear about it a bit more, one of the biggest bugbears in AOD has always been the high number of face-to-face -face appointments of clients who don't show. Um, it's about one in three, um, but we have found a, a strong preference for telehealth and, um, uh, you know, that's, that's really bearing some fruit. So our final slide is, um, is really talking about the fact that um, to make sure this moment in time isn't wasted, um, we've actually established four working groups of our staff. We've asked staff to sign up and show interest, um, if in, in, you know, register their interest. Um, and we're trying to capture the lessons learned and plan new ways of working, both in the immediate sense, but in the longer term. And the groups are considering flexible work. And I'm really keen to target a reduction in um, office-based work for uniting staff. Um, both for um, flexibility of work, but also cutting down on our environmental footprint, cutting down on our utilisation of physical facilities. Um, uh, we are also establishing communities of practice. Um, and as I said, looking at emergency relief, looking at the way in which we're delivering our services, you know, things that we never thought were possible, you know, have, have been uh, tried in this environment as a matter of necessity and they've tested us, but 
I think they've really helped us to to reflect on on what we're doing. Um, I reckon that many of the old paradigms in the community services sector were due for a bit of re-examination um, and, and just stuff that we'd always done that way. Um, I think this has given us the opportunity to say, well, maybe there are some better ways of doing things. Um, and uh, so this has been a really good time to do that. So thanks for listening and uh, look forward to hearing from the other presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Bronwyn. That was fantastic. I mean, a bit of a, a whistle stop tour. I am confident there is so much else um, that you could have shared with us if we had sort of all day. So I can't wait to get to the Q&A. So thank you so much. And um, really, uh, some of what you talked about is really about community and working in community. So hopefully we'll get to have a bit more of a discussion. So now I get to introduce Nicole Bartholomewes. Um, she's the Chief Executive Officer of CoHealth since 2019, having served in a range of leadership, senior leadership roles at the organisation since 2014. Uh, CoHealth is a leading community health service which operates across 30 sites in Victoria. And I'm sure um, I've seen your name heavily involved in uh, the COVID activities and testing and the like. So I'm sure your people have been very busy. Uh, CoHealth provides a range of services, its services, including medical, dental and allied health as well as alcohol and drug and mental health services. CoHealth focuses on the needs of disadvantaged communities, including those from refugee backgrounds, people experiencing homelessness, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Victorians, and people impacted by intergenerational poverty and trauma. Uh, Nicole is deeply committed to providing high quality health care to people that may otherwise miss out and also passionate about addressing the social determinants of poor health such as poverty, housing and education. Nicole has served on non-executive um, board member for Western Health and the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association. Um, without further ado, I think I'm going to I'm going to now hand over to Nicole for her to present to us. Welcome, Nicole. I've never really had the opportunity to work with you in this way, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Hi Deb, thank you for that very lovely uh, introduction and um, I'd also like to acknowledge my uh, fellow panel members that are with us today and um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, once again, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm sure there are lots of examples amongst the audience today of fantastic work uh, that the community sector is providing during COVID-19. Whilst there's many examples of the changes that we've had to implement at CoHealth, I'm actually going to use this time this afternoon to talk about our uh, public housing high-rise response. Uh, which initially commenced at um, Flemington and North Melbourne, where we were asked by the Department of Health and Human Services to um, undertake some testing and engage with community around key health messages. And of course, people will be well aware of the um, lockdown that followed uh, in Flemington and North Melbourne and the need for CoHealth to rapidly develop a, um, a comprehensive and holistic primary care model. I'll just flip to the next slide. So just a little bit about um, CoHealth. So we are a, um, as Deb said, a service delivery or healthcare organisation. Um, we have around 30 healthcare sites across Melbourne's North and West and employ close to a thousand staff. Um, our particular way that we work is to use a co-design approach to um, delivering services and we have a strong focus on health outcomes. As Deb mentioned, we provide a range of services along the, the continuum of care um, from prevention through to early intervention and treatment. And uh, part of the work that we do is really to try and influence uh, policy so that uh, we have health and social equity for all. Let's just move to the next slide. 
So what has the uh, high rise response involved? So Melbourne's um, public high rise estates have been identified as the accommodation setting that has increased risk of community transmission uh, for COVID-19. And everybody is aware of the, um, the Flemington and North Melbourne uh, lockdown. So since the lockdown in July, community health has played a critical role working with communities at these high rise towers right across Melbourne to keep people well and safe during the pandemic. The model of CARES uh, on the slide was developed by CoHealth in response to the Flemington and North Melbourne lockdown and has now evolved to be a place based model across a number of high rise towers in Melbourne. Uh, the scale of the model is determined by the level of risk for community transmission um, at each of the towers and can be scaled up or down as required. So for the model to be successful, uh, it's at its foundation um, is required to be co-designed, holistic and facilitated by community themselves. It's necessary for strong engagement and participation. So what uh, evolved was a place-based model uh, rapidly developed to respond to the Flemington and North Melbourne lockdown um, has actually been shaped and refined to be applicable to other settings. So there's four primary elements to the model. Uh, the first being health education in place and that's providing health promotion and key messages um, by a role that we've termed health concierges that are located at the base of each of the high rise towers. The health concierge role supports residents to stay safe, be informed and supported um, to access health and social support if required. Uh, as I mentioned, they're positioned at the base of the high rise towers, uh, generally are working in pairs and um, engaged residents that are coming up and down um, the towers. Uh, they provide residents with masks and hand sanitizers and ensure that residents are receiving the most up-to-date sort of daily health promotion messages. The second element of the model is early intervention. So we've been um, on site at the towers uh, undertaking COVID-19 testing. This might be a testing clinic that's set up at the base of the tower or in some uh, circumstances or situations, we've actually gone door to door uh, testing um, by our clinical staff. And we do that in partnership with either the health concierges or community health staff where there is an existing relationship with residents. And that's what we've found to be really important in all of this work is the um, utilising the existing relationships that we have with residents or employing people from the local community to support us um, to have those local relationships. The third element of the model is healthcare in place. So primary healthcare services for all residents. So we've established primary healthcare clinics at the base of the towers. Um, the clinics are staffed by GPs, nurses and AOD specialists and customer support. And the clinic provides clinical monitoring for all residents who have tested positive to COVID-19 and the provision of general medical care as required. The fourth element of the model is remote care and the remote access healthcare team uh, provide a telehealth needs assessment for people with COVID-19. So the team's notified of residents who have tested positive. Um, they'll actually then contact the resident and undertake a clinical assessment that identifies if the individual is at great risk to complications arising from COVID-19 and identifies their care and ongoing support needs. So people with low care needs are referred to their normal GP for ongoing monitoring and management, um, or it might be to a co-health GP if they don't have a, their own GP. And people who have greater needs or are identified as potentially being higher risk to the complications of COVID-19 are referred to the local acute health provider for monitoring. And it could be a hospital in the home uh, monitoring a service that they're engaged with, or if they're really unwell, they'll be admitted to hospital. Importantly, this service um, also contains a, uh, an isolation plan. So the health assessment team will work with individuals to co-design an isolation plan, which um, enables them to isolate safely 
and well during the quarantine period. And this ranges from a number of things. So it could be um, support to access groceries. It might be support to access the um, financial measures that have been put in place by state government. It could be um, arranging alternate accommodations so that they can uh, safely isolate for the, the quarantine period. Um, and this part of the model is extremely important if we want people to be able to isolate well and reduce the broader public health risk of community transmission. Just move to the next slide. So this slide gives you just a very quick high level um, snapshot of our work at the High Rhymes Towers. Um, so you'll be able to see that um, we've implemented the place-based model at six public high-rise estates um, in the north and west of Melbourne and continue to play an active support and care and monitoring role um, at these towers. The health concierge model has had a really positive impact for residents. So of the um, 108 health concierges that we uh, have employed in this model, uh, I think it's uh, around 65% of um, those employees have actually come from residents who are, who are residents in the towers. And that's been really important in terms of the um, engagement with the local community. We've actually implemented the health concierge uh, model across 21 high-rise towers in Melbourne's north and west. Move to the, the next slide, thanks. This is a really busy looking slide, um, but I will step you through it. So one of the um, key components of the place-based model, which I just spoke to, was the uh, remote health assessment team. So the team that's conducting health assessments via telehealth We've actually um, lifted that component of the model and um, are now applying it more broadly across Melbourne's north and west. So in response to um, the high numbers of people that were tested, uh, being tested as positive with COVID-19, we developed a partnership with Royal Melbourne Hospital and the North West Melbourne PHN to be able to offer an, the assessment and referral for clinical care and social support to all people who have tested COVID-19, positive to COVID-19, not just the people who are residents in the towers. Um, initially established as a three month pilot, um, this is really designed to reduce the pressure on Victoria's health system while supporting individuals to receive community-based care and referral to uh, acute care services, but also that really important aspect of the wraparound support um, to support their recovery and to support them to isolate well. So we know that around 70% of people who have COVID-19 can actually um, recover really well in community. They don't need hospital care, but they need ongoing um, active monitoring by a healthcare provider to ensure that their uh, condition or their symptoms don't escalate. And so this health assessment triaging service um, engages the person who has COVID-19. We undertake that assessment to determine um, what their risk status is. And if they can be, um, monitored and cared for in community, we refer the, the person back to their local GP uh, via the PHN and the PHN then assumes the care for the individual. If they're in the 30% that would need hospital care, we then refer the client to or person to the Royal Melbourne Hospital, who then either provides a hospital in the home monitoring service, and that's for around about 20% of people, and 10% um, uh, need to be at admitted to hospital and we're probably referring um, about one person a day at this stage uh, to hospital. So it actually demonstrates that the majority of people can be cared for well in the community. Um, referrals are received by the Care Pathways team from the Public Health Unit at the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, and we assess people's health and social needs um, as, I, as I've already described. Other services that we refer to would be um, counselling, AOD support and family, family violence services 
and again, really support people to be able to um, isolate during that 14 day quarantine period. So it's a decentralised um, care model and it's staffed by around 40 uh, GPs, nurses and allied health specialists um, and really represents a best practice model for people who have COVID-19. The model is, um, is working really, really well. Um, we've had lots of very positive feedback from uh, people who are enrolled in the program and the model is currently being rolled out statewide in partnership with community health and the acute health services. So um, a fantastic example, um, I think, of how uh, a local um, health service response has been able to be scaled um, at a regional level and now um, beyond the region across the state. Let's move to the next slide. So I just wanted to um, just take a couple of moments to talk about working with community. And I think from the examples that I've just talked about, um, but the examples right across CoHealth, um, much of our adaption and innovation um, to support during the community during the pandemic has really been based on that strong engagement and co-design with community. Um, examples of this work include our community participation team who have contacted um, or who contacted close to a thousand co-health clients in the very early onset of COVID-19 to understand what their health and care needs um, are and to seek feedback from them about how we could continue to provide a service during the pandemic. Um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander team who have adapt adapted their service models to ensure that uh, the community remains connected with each other. The homelessness team who are supporting individuals um, who have been provided with temporary accommodation, temporary hotel accommodation. Um, and we've supported those um, individuals by purchasing mobile phones and iPads so that they can stay connected. And um, the fantastic work of our refugee health team who employs bicultural workers and that's, they've absolutely been key during this pandemic to ensure that um, messages and uh, you know, various pieces of communication have been able to be translated um, and communicated uh, across the many multicultural uh, groups that we have in our community. Um, they've been able to reach community rapidly through social media to update people on the COVID-19 changes and share translated resources. And the link that you see on the slide takes you to our YouTube channel where these translated resources um, have been used for general community engagement, um, including the high rise response. And I think there's actually about five or six um, videos uh, in various languages um, which talk about COVID-19. So in closing, uh, the key to the success has been working with individuals and community uh, to really understand how we best meet their healthcare needs, but also the need to continually adapt as the pandemic involves and people's needs changes. And it's been um, interesting, and I just note Bronwyn's comments also that we've, um, you know, adapted really well to um, virtual uh, modalities uh, to telehealth, but what we're seeing now, and I, I, um, I'm hearing the feedback from our staff, but I'm also hearing feedback from clients that um, clients, you know, whilst they readily took up the virtual online um, opportunities that we moved to, are now starting to say that they'd like, you know, they'd like to wait um, until their next appointment can be face to face. So I think, you know, it's important whilst we've rapidly adapted and changed um, our services to be able to respond to the, the pandemic, that we do need to continually be checking in with both staff and clients um, about what their needs are and their preferences, because we're absolutely going to have to continue to evolve um, our service offering for the, for the next little while at least. Thanks again for the opportunity to present um, and I look forward to um, responding to the questions. Thanks, Deb. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. You were able to condense a very complex um, health response, which is 
probably never been done into one page. It's remarkable. And um, I, I, I it was a very full slide. A very full, I just want to say congratulations because um, we are um, uh, forever grateful to our first responders and health providers for the work that they've done over the last many, many months. And, um, and please pass on our thanks to, um, to all of your staff for the incredible work they've done. Um, we, we, we're proud Victorians. And I must say, um, uh, in terms of Bronwyn's slide and your slide and some of the community work that you've done, uh, working in the community, with the community, with our clients and with our community has been, um, has been the most, one of the most single important things that's brought about success. And we mustn't lose that beyond COVID. Okay, now I get to introduce, uh, introduce um, Dr. Stephen Grunart, Grunart for you. Um, so Stephen is a registered psychologist with more than 20 years of experience in the drug and alcohol sector as a, both a clinician, a researcher and a manager. He's currently the CEO of Odyssey House Victoria, a board member of VCOS and a past president of the Victorian Alcohol and Other Drug Association. Stephen has worked as a senior counsellor in a range of settings and has con conducted research on alcohol use, treatment effectiveness, um, family work and a range of um, work about working with fathers. Um, Stefan has contributed to several resources for workers around parenting and family violence and he regularly provides advice to government and delivers presentations at national and international conferences. Um, in 2008 Stefan was invited uh, to a meeting on global drug policy held at the United Nations. Um, Office of Drugs and Crime in Vienna. And he received a Harvard Fellowship to win, uh, attend the Harvard Business School in 2014. Stefan also has a, um, a couple of teenage sons, according to his bio, um, enjoys travel, renovating sport, gardening and cooking. And I'm sure there's lots of homeschooling at the moment uh, that, that all of us are, are enjoying uh, to some degree anyway. So I'd like to hand over to Stefan, who's going to um, present um, to us this morning and then we'll move to questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Deb, for that uh, introduction. And um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge that I'm also on Wurundjeri land and thank Deb for her acknowledgement, but just to also reiterate our commitment to uh, closing the gap and um, to reconciliation and to doing the best we can to support our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community during this challenging time. Um, a few bits on Odyssey, just for those who don't um, know much about us. We see about 16,000 clients each year uh, from across 30 different sites in the community. And we also run uh, three residential rehabilitation programs. But I'm gonna share some experiences, not only from us, from some other colleagues in the sector. So I just wanna acknowledge all of the other AOD treatment providers and uh, thank them for our for the support we've been offering each other during this time. It's been really great to come together and share thoughts and ideas. Um, you may know, like many sectors, that prior to COVID, the AOD sector uh, was only able to meet about half the demand uh, that we had in Australia. So we're already a pretty stretched system. Um, and there's plenty of evidence uh, to say that alcohol use in the community has gone up amongst um, some people. Uh, and whilst service demand has been fairly stable at the high levels it has been, um, we certainly expect that to increase over the recovery period for the next two or three years if, if past history has been any predictor of future um, based on you know, traumatic experiences. And, and um, not that we've experienced anything like this before, but we certainly expect the demand to increase. Uh, an observation that I made at the start of um, the pandemic was that uh, drug and alcohol services seem to sit somewhere in the middle between uh, health services and um, and sort of community services in terms of their response. So um, particularly services that were aligned with health services were really quick to implement infection management, social distancing protocols and um, outbreak management plans and to start using PPE. Um, I think there was a number in the drug and alcohol sector that um, you know, we're modifying protocols from blood spills and other things that we had on hand and started to learn what, what PPE even was. Um, but there was a real reluctance to move away from face-to-face -face service immediately. Um, 
not wanting to, um, in a sense, abandon clients in the community. And there was quite a tension between some of the medical nursing staff in the facilities and the uh, programs who were really pushing for a, a model that felt quite alienating um, to our clients uh, and the outreach workers who just wanted to be out there and stand beside the clients uh, early on. I think that settled down and we, um, we found a sort of an appropriate level that was in line with the guidelines. Some of the, um, the first early sort of issues and responses that we faced across the sector, um, we had very quick discussions with DHHS around um, and very quickly we identified what the essential parts of the service were. And I just wanna thank um, the staff in the department for their support and colleagues around that. Um, whilst the guidelines were a bit slow to come out and probably missed the first wave, they were really well and truly in place and well thought out by the time second wave came and that was great. And like other sectors, we also had the funding and flexibility around targets and new models, which made it easy to adapt. Um, like others, you know, we struggled, some services didn't have much PPE and later we were prioritised. Uh, and we started to see a rise in um, in prices of many drugs, including methamphetamines, which um, more than doubled in price and, and a switch to other drugs by our clients, um, including alcohol. Uh, and also many clients who were being picked up for breaches of, um, of rules, uh, even in that first wave. Um, and we were sort of working with um, the department to try and make sure there was a, a positive solution focus rather than a punitive one around that to pretty vulnerable people who weren't going to be able to afford those fines. Um, we, we certainly across the, the sort of sector were providing sort of innovative support and new ways, um, as you've heard in some of the housing estates, but also in the hotels and some of the COVID isolation and recovery facilities. Uh, and they were certainly new ways of delivering support. Um, and really didn't get much additional funding for some of the new uh, things. Uh, there's a small injection from the Commonwealth around some uh, telephone and online support across Australia for those people who were starting to pick up alcohol in particular. Um, and unlike mental health, which uh, had quite a comprehensive plan for and some good strong injection of new funding, um, we know that the, the need and demand in mental health is so strong, there's rarely ever any trickle down into drug and alcohol. So we really needed to advocate and find creative ways of using the resources that we did have in drug and alcohol. Um, very quickly on, we, we and others like, um, like uh, Shark uh, did some surveys of, of clients to identify how they were going and how they were feeling. Um, and uh, very early on, they were concerned and anxious about being abandoned uh, and worried about their, their treatment supports drying up. And that wasn't just sort of counselling, but that's their pharmacotherapies, their needle syringe programs. Um, and the response, I think, to some really good policy changes was very quick. Um, and that included uh, much more flexible uh, dosing arrangements with more takeaway doses, so they weren't having to go out and uh, attend pharmacies every day, um, but also um, sort of expansion of trials around depot buprenorphine, which is a longer in uh, longer acting injectable one. So again, less need for for daily or, or you know every two days support uh, that could be extended over a period of time, and the uptake on that's been quite good. Um, we worked hard to make sure we were securing, you know, needle syringe programs uh, and things like the medically supervised injecting and the supply chain of pharmacotherapy so those clients' medications could be secured. Um, and our staff across the sector, as they did in many other areas, really rapidly transi transitioned in our community services to digital access. Um, and I'll speak a bit about the residential programs later on. Um, the feedback early on from, from clients was that any support was better than no support, um, but most of them thought that face-to-face -face support was superior. Now, there were some clients that preferred um, phone calls and, and that sort of di digital access because it meant they didn't have to travel. Uh, they liked the flexibility of appointments with more after-hours sessions. Um, and certainly, as, as Bowman and others have said, the no-show rates 
uh, drop, particularly in our forensic clients where we had much greater compliance than general. Um, and also there was some preference for sort of two 30 minute sessions a week rather than one hour session. Um, so most of the online support was delivered by phone early on. Of course, there were some issues with um, people's devices and, and not having enough data. Uh, and so many agencies, including Odyssey, started um, giving out or loaning um, handsets where we could. Uh, and we know there's some other programs that whilst they've been slow to come out, will really boost that capacity over time. Uh, but it, of course, we also were aware that some of the digital access was um, less appropriate from some Aboriginal and cold clients and particularly the vulnerable uh, who found that difficult to um, access. Uh, and we were getting that feedback from clients. Um, I should say uh, some of the some of the ways that we were doing digital access was some of our day programs went to online and Zoom groups. So we're delivering psychoeducational sessions that way. Uh, we at Odyssey started running um, a play group with some of our uh, parents with addictions and their children where we drop off a whole lot of art and craft materials and gardening equipment and then we run sort of joint sessions through the school holidays and they proved to be really, really popular. Um, and, um, and we did also try, uh, as did many, um, some video telephone calls uh, and we were one of, of many to use Health Direct. And some people quite like that, um, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges for the staff and the clients around those, those programs. So I think for staff um, in particular, they found uh, moving to telephone support in the community services uh, difficult or challenging because they found it really difficult to assess adequately, assess for vulnerability, assess for people's uh, relapses or hygiene without being able to see someone's face. Uh, assessing for family violence and, and conflict in the, and how things were at home. Uh, and so we were rapidly developing guidelines to try and support that and, and use some video calls to enhance the telephone support. Um, that was much easier to do when you'd had an established relationship with the client um, and really difficult at the start with, uh, with new clients. Uh, our staff found it really difficult to do some of the more in-depth counselling and trauma-focused work over the phone. It was easier to do case management and check-in calls and um, you know, act, needing access to support and other services, but to, to really go in deep was much more difficult. And, um, and over time we found that we really were struggling to engage some of the new harder to reach client groups and populations that our outreach workers would typically find and bring into our services. So we needed to start getting out there and finding new ways to connect to those, those clients. It's fair to say there was some envy across uh, our different program types. So the people who were working from home, um, as they became more socially isolated in our community services, they envied the people in our residential services who were able to go into work and to see their colleagues and kind of do business as usual. And they were adapting and juggling school, homeschooling with kids and uh, feeling isolated. Uh, whilst the staff in our, in our residential programs, I think early on, um, were really anxious about being at work, uh, felt that those at home got to do their washing and see their kids and, and, um, and had, have the good life uh, while they were sort of in at work. So I think over time they realised that everyone was struggling with different things and doing it tough. Um, I think as we went on in the, in, um, particularly in the second wave, uh, many services were having challenging with, challenges with rostering as uh, either there was some positive cases among staff or close contacts among staff and having to isolate while they were getting tested and not being able to access their residential programs. Uh, and we certainly identified that there's a real lack of a specialist surge workforce, particularly in our resi services where it really takes about a year to get our staff up to speed. Uh, and you take a few of those out of the system, particularly those doing overnights who don't understand the systems um, and bringing in agency and other staff wouldn't be great. Uh, and we also um, tended to buy out staff who were working casually across multiple other agencies, including some aged care and disability. So they just became dedicated staff to one agency like Odyssey so that they wouldn't be cross, 
crossing different client cohorts. Uh, and that proved really sort of successful and, and people understood that and gave them more security in their work. Uh, some of the challenges um, in our uh, residential services, I think it was identified early on that they were particularly vulnerable to, um, to infections and, and outbreaks. And so a lot of work gone into the management plans in those, in those areas. Um, bed numbers across uh, the state in particular were reduced significantly to about 50 or 60 percent of typical bed numbers. And by and large, that's because most of our services have clients in twin share rooms and we were moving to single share to really comply with some social distancing uh, best practice advice. Uh, and that put real pressure on our wait lists and the support we needed to do, uh, helping people get into resi services uh, and our waiting list certainly blew out. Many services capped their waiting list at one or 200 people and stopped taking new referrals. Uh, and so then other services, their waiting list grew even bigger as a result. Um, some of the obviously changes were reducing or ceasing uh, visitors to those facilities, doing some block uh, teams at different times so that it was less crossover block admissions in the withdrawals and detox units. So you'd bring in a group of clients together, you test them at the start, effectively they've been in quarantine sort of together with themselves. And then by the end, when you were testing them again and, and um, they were going on to other services, particularly resi programs, you had a lot more confidence that you weren't bringing in um, groups that had had a lot of exposure into your rehab settings where the potential for for outbreaks were really substantial. And that across the sector has had a fantastic um, impact in really reducing the spread. There's been a few positives in, in detox. They were contained so quickly um, and really didn't spread further than that. Uh, and to date, we haven't had any positive in any of the residential program, the rehab programs. Uh, we did have a, um, uh, a false positive or an inconclusive that we treated as a, as a positive, which we, um, we did then a, tr a dry sort of run of our outbreak management plan and everyone went into isolation and all stuff. And, and that worked really well and, and clients and staff were incredibly supportive of that whole process. Um, and so I think we really value how well the sectors work together to really minimise the, the infections um, across those sort of services. Um, Odyssey also managed to um, establish a whole new resi rehab program that just finished construction in April, um, right during COVID. Uh, and we managed to train all of our staff using lots of online platforms and technology and, and, um, and get our first batch of clients there. And we even had um, a group of clients from our Melbourne resi rehab go down and really help set the culture and establish that program with the staff. Uh, so that felt like it was quite a, an achievement. Um, and I think in terms of our staff, we, we also um, tried lots of things to support their wellbeing. We did a, a, another big survey of them and, and um, took note of their feedback. We tried some of those wellness support programs and online um, things for mindfulness and yoga. And most of those were a bit of a flop. We didn't have great uptake, um, but our two wellbeing days um, that we gave to staff, particularly around some of the long weekends to give them a four day break, was so well valued. Um, I think people have just been so fatigued, haven't taken their leave, um, saving it up for when they can actually go somewhere. And so that extra day off was really valued and um, some wellbeing packs that we've sent around also have been uh, well received. So um, I think the key messages for me are really that we, we adapted well and quickly across the whole AOD sector. It's been satisfactory for most clients, but many of them looking forward to face-to-face -to, -face to really do some more in-depth, but we'll certainly keep online telehealth digital access for complementing that and for those that prefer it. Um, the lack of workforce support development planning shows our vulnerabilities for the sector. And we're certainly expecting big increases as we move out of recovery and we're starting to see the early signs of that. That's it for me. Thank you, Stefan. Fantastic. We're going to get you all back up on screen. And I'm wondering if um, you can open up the Q&A down the bottom in your chat just to the panellists, because there's a few questions there. There's a couple there that relate to um, ability to access 
drugs or the availability of heroin. I'm wondering if, um, Stefan, you can respond to those two questions. They're both from Shirley Baker. Can you see those? Uh, yes, I can yeah. see them. If you could respond to those questions for Shirley, that would be fantastic. And then I'm, I'm going to go to, um, I'm going to go to Nicole for, for, the, for the next question. Sure. So look, the, um, the, there's a sort of an ongoing assessment of what's happening in the drug market. And I think certainly the border closes uh, between states uh, and uh, the less movement has meant that um, some of the drugs uh, have certainly been harder to source, particularly methamphetamine. And, um, and certainly the prices are usually a sign of that and things like um, price of cocaine and others have really skyrocketed. And so people have been moving across to other drugs, which you know, at times aren't as popular. Um, we're certainly seeing plenty of heroin around. Um, and sometimes that, that then moves out into country areas as well, um, where people can you know, travel and train and, and other ways of, um, of procuring those drugs. So uh, I think, um, and, and a lot of clients have also moved to alcohol to top up their other drug use is what we're hearing. So um, some, some, some difficulty in some drugs, um, but there's still plenty of stuff out there that um, people also stockpiled as they did with uh, toilet paper and things in the supermarket. There was a bit of that going on, I think, amongst dealers to, to prepare for this. Um, so the other ones around buprenorphine, is it available? Uh, one of the, so my understanding is that all the pharmacotherapies have, um, have certainly been uh, have got great, great Australian stocks of those and they have been uh, available. There might be some um, difficulties in some locations at getting the, um, getting the doses out there, but my understanding is that there's really good Australian stocks from that and there should be no shortage of supply there. That's fantastic. Um, actually, Nicole's just answered the question, which was, is she going to think about, because the model is so well developed, um, thinking about the model she's used for the high rises being something that uh, has utility beyond, or well, if we can talk about beyond COVID, because we're still going to be in a bit of a state of alert, aren't we, Nicole, for some time. Do you want to just talk a little bit about the model, though? And obviously, it's been really well received. Um, it'll probably be in place for some time, I suspect, and then what it might mean for the future to make sure that people uh, get access to high quality health care. Absolutely. And I think, you know, across the community uh, sector, we've known for a long time that our vulnerable and marginalised communities um, have often missed out on being able to access um, quality, um, timely accessible healthcare and um, what this pandemic has absolutely shown is the um, the need to design and deliver services that meets the needs of this very vulnerable group who for a long time um, haven't been well supported around their healthcare and you know the engagement and the delivery of a primary care response at the base of those towers has absolutely provided access to that care and so you know a is there a need to continue that post COVID-19 and what might that look like interestingly when we um I mean CoHealth has had a long relationship with the public high-rise towers in Melbourne's North and West through a range of different services that we deliver. And when we first responded to the Flemington and North Melbourne situation, um, around about a third of those residents were already co-health clients. So we're already using a range of co-health services. Um, and so to many of the residents, we were known and uh, the feedback from residents was that they felt quite reassured when they could look out their window and see co-health staff on the ground providing um, health care. And so it really reinforced to us the importance of that um, well-established relationship, a relationship that's built on trust, but also uh, just going back to those, you know, place-based models and thinking about actually putting those services um, in community where they're needed. So I think it's, you know, it's sort of, it certainly opened lots of questions for us um, and we're certainly going back to the literature and having a look at um, where this is actually happening um, elsewhere to think about what we might put in place more long-term. 
that's fantastic Nicole now Bronwyn's already um, been on the keyboard and answered the question about PPE so there was a question from I think Daryl about um, uh, recognizing um, the, the great the survey that um, Uniting have done um, as a workplace does Uniting provide some level of PPE and masks and or wipes and and um, Bronwyn's answer we've rolled those things out as a matter of course we've made it very clear that if people want PPE at home we can get it to them which is fantastic I wouldn't mind going to Bronwyn now with a bit of a, a bit of a not so much a wrap up question but this sort of notion of community it, it strikes me that listening to all the presentations that the value of that has really kicked in whether it's co-design um, meeting people where they're at um, and really getting an idea of having your finger on the pulse about what's going to work because when it comes to COVID-19 it's it's both very it's very personal um, I'm wondering Bronwyn in terms of your reflections um, you know we talk about community development I've been around I'm, I'm getting old now um, we've never really been able to land it as something that's actually really vital but it's really come to the fore as something that's been actually crucial during COVID-19 can I get you to make some reflections on how we might take that forward and to get governments and funders to be persuaded that it's a real thing? Sometimes um, community development has such a kind of a long and never ending time frame that governments go, oh, you know, we need to roll something out a lot more quickly. And, uh, you know, so we're not prepared to put in the hard yards. Um, and, you know, I think a great example was the, um, uh, the the strategy you know around the high rise that actually began a long time ago but then was stopped um, uh, you know which which really sought to engage those communities uh, on a whole range of things that would you know make a difference to their future employment opportunities training um, you know the health things that Nicole's been talking about plus the more specialized service but you know they but people gave up on them so you know I think you're right I think here the the other thing is um, you know we all talk about consumer engagement we all talk about hearing the consumer voice but we all know that um, uh, you know kind of hanging in there and doing that very intentionally for the long long term it is is actually really hard work um, and yet I think in this environment um, you know uh, because of our normal practices has have been disrupted that it has provided that opportunity for us to um, uh, you know reflect on um, you know engaging people where they are in a much more intentional way and mm. so you know it's almost like we need to bottle that mm. and and um, uh, you know be able and willing to um, uh, you know question some of the holy cows if you like mm. in in service in service delivery stuff that and you know I even think it all goes to the utilization of our workforce um, you know we've become very very um, you know strict about um, scope of practice for example in a whole lot of you know different disciplines across the health and human services sector and I think this environment tells us that that's always not not always helpful um, uh, for clients and for, for good outcomes for people and maybe you know we need to um, get a little bit more flexible um, yeah, I agree in, in the way, I, I way we work with um, people. I agree now we did have mm. one last question which was really about clinicians graduating and needing to do their placements but we're going to get back to Emma offline about that because it's actually a very real issue that we're going yeah. to have a supply issue I just mm. want to tell our panelists that people are dropping off but actually the feedback on this session has been remarkable people using words like fascinating really interesting um, great to have hear from all of you and, and all of your learnings um, supporting what people are thinking but in a different way so I want to say thank you to all of you today for putting the time in to share your wisdom um, there will be an evaluation of this at the end we will get your slides and the recording out once you've had a chance to have a look at it so it's a gift that keeps giving in terms of people being able to listen to what you've had to say today thank you so much Bronwyn Nicole um, and you. Stefan and thanks for my my team back at the office for helping put this together as well um, and let's all stay safe and uh, the numbers are going down 
uh, we've learned a lot, as Bronwyn just said, uh, we've learned a lot about ourselves and what needs to happen because actually things might get just that little bit harder for some of the people we work with. Uh, so um, I think mm -hmm. Bronwyn's like, we're going to need to look at, this, look, look at this in the eyes and there's a lot more work for us to do over the next couple of years to support the people that we, we work with and we care about. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your week. There's a bit of sunshine out there. Um, and thanks for coming along. <laughs>